Let's pray. God, your people have gathered. We have lifted our voices in prayer and praise. We have read scripture. And as we read scripture, the Bible reads us. Pour your spirit out, we pray. On all who gather in this place, on all who are worshiping remotely, on all who gather anywhere to worship you this day, pour your spirit out. Allow us to know you with us. Grant us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to love and strength to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. So I, I, don't, I don't really know how to say this gently, but um, you all are a peculiar bunch of folks. <laughs> I, know, I know that sounds pretty rich coming from me. <laughs> um, and I don't say that as an insult. I, I, I say that more as an, as an observation, Okay. And, and I want to I expound on that a little bit. The, the, um, the Random House Dictionary uh, defines uh, peculiar uh, this way. A peculiar is something that is strange or odd or uncommon or belonging exclusively to a particular person, group, or thing. Peculiar. Peculiar. Now we generally associate peculiar with, with things that are, that are obscure or infrequent. And what we are doing here this morning when we gather in this place uh, or, or, or tune in on television or online or, or, or any of of. Uh, the, the folks that gather in, in uh, churches around this community, around uh, our state, our world, when, when we gather in places like this on Sunday mornings, uh, we're doing something very, very peculiar. Let me throw some numbers at you. The U.S. Department of, um, of Commerce... Um, reports that there are, uh, as of Friday, um, a, a little over 336 million people in the United States of America. And according to a, um, a, uh, uh, a, a group called Statista, it's a, uh, it's a data and statistical analysis group, According to Statista, uh, a little under 20% of that 336 million people, uh, a little over 60 million people, uh, are gathered on Sunday mornings in places like this. Only about 20% of the people in the United States are doing what we're doing this morning. And, and, and those 60 million people, 60 four million people are going to gather together in buildings like this. They're going to pray some prayers. They're going to sing some hymns. They're going to read some words out of an old, old book. <coughs> and, 
and they're going to do what we're doing right now, what you're doing right now. They're going to hear a sermon. And it's the sermon thing that is odd. Because sermon preaching and sermon hearing is a unique, a uniquely Christian undertaking. Now, this may not seem uh, all that odd or uncommon or peculiar to folk like you, to folk like us who, who, who gather and, uh, and, and do this regularly, who, who, for whom uh, this sermon thing is, is something that we do uh, every week or, 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 or almost every week. What we're doing here today is not the norm for most folks. It's not even the norm for many people who are religious. There are many other religions in the world in which people do things like uh, read from old books and recite particular <coughs> pardon me, recite particular uh, acts of worship. Uh, there, are, there are religions in the world that encourage their, their adherents and their practitioners to cultivate individual acts of piety and, and, to, and to perform uh, certain rituals or engage in, in some form uh, of meditation, quiet meditation. All of these, all of these practices are intended to bring the practitioner of those religions closer to God. But sermon preaching and sermon hearing is something that only a minority of, of a peculiar group of people do, of, of people calling themselves Christian. And we don't come by this peculiarity by accident because... Because we worship a peculiar God. A God that acts in uncommon and unexpected ways. And we see this peculiarity a little bit uh, in uh, this passage out of Mark's gospel that we read this morning. Mark tells the story. I, I, love, I love Mark. I, I, I love the way that Mark tells the story in, in his own unique, peculiar way. Uh, Mark, <clears throat> Mark tells uh, the, the story as, uh, of, of Jesus beginning early uh, in his ministry. Mark gets to the point. Mark is, is what I call the Reader's Digest condensed version of the, the gospel message, right? Mark, Mark, um, Mark only hits the high points, the, the, uh, important, uh, the important things, what Mark thinks is the important things. Mark does not, does not waste uh, ink or paper uh, on ancillary details, uh, unlike, unlike some preachers who shall remain nameless because I don't want my feelings hurt. What the other gospel writers spend, um, or, or what Mark spends half a chapter on, takes the other gospel writers um, two or three chapters to tell. For instance, Matthew Matthew takes two complete chapters, chapters 3 and chapter 4, uh, to tell about Jesus being baptized, Jesus spending time in the wilderness, uh, being, uh, facing the temptation, and calling his disciples. Mark, Mark has Jesus dunked in and out of the wilderness and, and, and calling the disciples uh, all in, in, in less, than, less than half a chapter. Uh, uh, the, the, the seven, uh, uh, well, uh, t the first 20 verses of, of the first chapter, Jesus has experienced all of that in Mark's gospel. And, and we pick up the story of Jesus calling the disciples, uh, as Mark tells it, immediately after he comes out of uh, his 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. And, and, and Jesus uh, 
lets everybody know that he's about to get down to business. He even, he even says so as much. And his first words were, now is the time. Now is the time. And the first thing that Jesus does is, is he finds a couple of guys fishing, and he says to them, follow me. And they do. You find anything strange about that? I mean, the, the story is familiar to us. And so, so maybe in its familiarity, it, it, it's, lost its, it, it's lost its ability to, to, to shock, to, to grab us by the collar. And maybe, maybe I'm overthinking things a little bit, but, but I think that, that, that uh, it's odd that these fishermen brother don't ask a single question. Not one. Jesus walks up and they drop everything. They stop everything and they go. And one short sentence later, it happens again. There is no what. There is no why. There's no who are you. There's no questions about where are we going. How are we going to know when we get there? How long will we be gone? Nobody asks, do I need to call my wife and tell her I'm going to be late for dinner? No one, no one asks a single question about, well, when we catch all these people, whatever that means, what are we going to do with them? Four guys, trained only as fishermen, just doing their jobs. And out of nowhere, this strange itinerant preacher comes along and shouts out an invitation to them to come and follow. And, and, and they immediately, without reluctance, without hesitance, without question, drop their nets and they stumble along after him. And for centuries, for centuries, preachers, people like me, in countless sermons, have pointed to these four, to these disciples' call stories, and, and, and this passage in particular, as an example of how we are to follow if, if we are truly faithful disciples. The Lord calls we drop everything and we go now. Now, I don't know about you, but I struggle with that interpretation. I can't, I can't, I can't get me, I can't get my mind wrapped around that kind of a response. It's not anything with which I am familiar. There is, there is a call story in Scripture that I can absolutely identify with. Jonah. You remember Jonah? I can understand Jonah's call story. Jonah was reluctant. Remember, remember in, in, in the first chapter of Jonah, and now Jonah, if you want to read the story, it, it, you go home this afternoon after worship, and, and, and Jonah is, is right after uh, that well-known, well-read uh, well uh, Old Testament book of Obadiah, and right before Micah, 
or Mika, as my Old Testament pro professor used to call it, right between Obadiah and Micah. And, and, and God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Jonah got up and ran the other way to a place called Tarshish. Jonah wasn't just reluctant. Jonah ran the other way. God wanted Jonah to go to this place called Nineveh. It was, it was a terrible place according uh, to what we read in Scripture. A den of iniquity. And Jonah didn't want to go, so he didn't, at least not at first. I can relate to that call story. I was reluctant, Debbie can tell you, when I first began wrestling with, with, with my call to ministry, I ran <laughs> the other way for five years. I ignored it, pretended it didn't happen. But these fishermen in Mark's telling of the story, theirs is a response with which I am completely unfamiliar. In fact, I don't know anyone, not a single person, who has responded to God's call in their lives like these four did. So I'm thinking maybe, I'm thinking maybe that all these sermons that I heard growing up about and all the lessons I've learned uh, about how we, should, how we should respond to God's call exactly like the fishermen, I, I, I'm beginning to think that, that maybe they were off the mark a, a little bit. Believe it or not, preachers don't always get it right. Even this one. <laughs> I've been thinking, what if, what if the message of this particular story in Mark's gospel is not really about uh, the four guys named Simon and Andrew and James and John? What if it's not about them at all? What, what if, what if the, the, the message of, of, of this passage isn't even about you and me and how we should respond? There's a wonderful Theologian, I, I, I really, I, I really uh, appreciate her insight uh, at times. And, and on this particular uh, passage, uh, her name is Barbara Brown Taylor. And Barbara Brown Taylor uh, suggests that, that, this, that this passage is really a story about God, not the disciples and not us. And, and, to, and to focus on what the disciples did and what the disciples had to give, had to give up and how they responded uh, and what they knew or didn't know uh, about Jesus before he came along that day is to put the accent or to put the emphasis on the wrong thing. The focus should be on God and the power of God to walk up to a group of fishermen and create in them and, and instill in them faith where there was no faith, to, to, to create disciples where there were none just a moment before. Think about that. And, and look, I, I, this is not to imply that we have no choice. Okay, we do. But too often, I think, too often, we have, mis we have had this mistaken idea that our faith journey is entirely up to us. Too often we have, we have, we have this idea uh, in, in our minds that, 
that at our through the sermons that we hear that suggest to us this that that we that we have to determine that that, that we must decide that, that that we have to take the initiative that that we have to get right with God in order to be right we, we sometimes believe that we have to do all these kinds of things, that we have to, have to act in that certain way uh, in order to please God. And the better that we do these things, the more likely it is that we're going to earn our salvation so that we can get into heaven. And now I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right at all. The, the, the fact of the matter is that God will do what God will do. The story of Jonah is about the persistence of God. God doesn't take no for an answer. God was going to get his message to the people of Nineveh one way or another. Now, Jonah finally came around to that understanding, and he got on board, so to speak, although reluctantly. But if Jonah had steadfastly refused, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm, I'm dead certain, as a matter of fact, that God would have found and sent someone else. Because that's the peculiar way that God acts. And in our reading uh, in Mark's gospel this morning, God acts uh, in and through Jesus Christ. And the time had come for God to announce the coming of the kingdom of heaven. And, and just like in the Jonah story, God calls regular people to help get the message out. You see, God chooses not to work alone. God chooses to have us be part of what God does. And our freedom to choose, our, our decision, is not about what is going to ultimately happen because God's already got that figured out. Our choice is simply whether or not we're going to participate. It's interesting to me that Jesus' first words to Andrew and Simon and James and John had nothing at all to do about with believing anything. Did you notice that? First thing Jesus says to them is to follow. Come follow. Belief for these four came through watching and hearing and seeing Jesus speak and act. Belief for these four came through receiving the love that Jesus offered. But their first call was just to follow. Now they're going to struggle along the way. But as they struggled, they also learned and they experienced more and more. But always, always, always they were invited to and encouraged to follow. Follow. You are here this morning because in some peculiar way you have been called. You didn't stumble in here haphazardly even if you're not sure why you're here. 
You're here because in some way you've been called, you've been been invited, either directly or indirectly. You have been invited to this place, called to this place by no one other than God. Now, in the coming weeks, we're, we're going to hear sermons. We're going we're to talk about what it means to believe. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna learn a little bit more about what it means to, uh, to, to be uh, disciples. But today, today, Jesus is calling us, all of us, and saying, follow me. Follow me. And it's an invitation of promise, real promise. And it's an invitation of real demands. And it, it might... It might make you uncomfortable. Probably does at times. And we may, we may be reluctant. But we never follow alone. We never go alone. The peculiar thing is that when we leave this place here in a few minutes, whether, whether we are like Jonah Reluctant and hesitant, needing a little encouragement, a little prodding, a little push by the Holy Spirit. Or even if we're, if we're like the four fishermen, not knowing where we're going or how we're going to get there or, 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 or what we're going to do when we get to wherever we're going, uh, we're, we're still we're going to drop everything and go. Even, even if we're like that, regardless, we, we discover when we follow that, that along the way we are transformed. We're transformed. We're changed in some unique, peculiar way by God's grace. We discover faith where perhaps there had been little faith or no faith before. We we grow into being disciples where perhaps there was no sign of that, no indication of that before. And we know, and we know in ways that speak to us that the kingdom of heaven has drawn near, that God has come closer, closer to us than we are to ourselves. And everything about life, our lives, changes. That's the good news. That's the good news. That's the gospel message. And it it is, is a peculiar thing indeed. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.